Service to America, a history of the men and women from St. Charles who served their country. St. Charles has always been a patriotic town, and the residents of our town have a long and proud tradition of service, both in the military and on the home front, dating back to the 1860s and the Civil War. Let's take a look back at some of the men and women from St. Charles history to see how they have served their country. St. Charles and the Civil War. During the Civil War, St. Charles was home to a training ground and recruiting center and an important Army General, John F. Farnsworth. Farnsworth was born in Eaton, Canada in 1820. As a young adult, he moved to Ann Arbor and studied law at the University of Michigan. Shortly after being admitted to the bar in 1841, he moved to St. Charles to set up a law practice. Farnsworth took up residence in a home along Geneva Road on the west side of the Fox River. After a time, he became involved in politics and was elected to Congress in 1857. He served two terms as a Republican congressman, but was unable to secure his party's nomination for a third term. Instead, he turned his attention to the war effort. Barnesworth had become friends with Abraham Lincoln and in fact was instrumental in helping Lincoln get the Republican Party's nomination for president. When war broke out in 1861, Farnsworth saw a need for a training camp in the Fox Valley area. He approached his friend, President Lincoln, and requested that he be allowed to establish a training camp here in St. Charles. He was granted permission to start Camp Kane, a cavalry training camp, on property he owned along the east bank of the Fox River. The commission to establish Camp Kane was given on August 11, 1861, and by August 20th, the first unit of the Illinois 8th Cavalry had formed. Two cavalry units were trained at Camp Kane, the 8th and 17th Illinois. Today, the land that was once Camp Kane is Langham Park, located on the east side of town between 7th Avenue and the Fox River. By 1862, John Farnsworth had risen to the rank of Brigadier General, but in 1863, he resigned his commission to return to his career in politics. He was once again elected to Congress, serving another five terms as the U.S. Representative from the Illinois 2nd District. After leaving Congress in 1873, Farnsworth returned to Chicago for seven years to practice law. In 1880, he moved to Washington, D.C. and remained there until his death in 1897. In 2012, descendants of General Farnsworth contacted the St. Charles Heritage Center and donated the desk and chair he used while serving in the House of Representatives. The items can be seen on display in the St. Charles History Museum. Both the 8th and 17th Illinois Cavalry units participated in some of the major battles of the war. According to several accounts, Marcellus Jones of the 8th Illinois Cavalry is credited with firing the first shot at the Battle of Gettysburg. The account described in the history of the 8th Cavalry Regiment, Illinois Volunteers during the Great Rebellion by Dr. Abner Hard states that after being alerted to the advance of the Confederates, Jones, a lieutenant in the 8th Cavalry, borrowed the Sharps carbine from his sergeant, Levi S. Schaefer, rested it on a fence rail, and fired the first shot. In 1886, Jones and Schaefer returned to the spot where the first shot was fired and installed a small monument made of limestone mined in DuPage County. The monument can still be seen there today. In addition to the many men from St. Charles who served in the war, several women from town saw service as nurses, most notably Lucy Whipple Campbell Kaiser. Lucy Whipple was the daughter of Dr. and Mrs. Whipple. In the 1850s, after the tragic death of her husband, Lucy came to live with her parents in St. Charles. She was part of a small contingent of St. Charles residents who attended Lincoln's inauguration in Washington, D.C. Upon returning home and hearing talk of the impending war, Lucy vowed she would be ready to help when the time came. She was one of the first females to volunteer and be accepted into service. She was at the battles of Vicksburg and Shiloh and also served at the Jefferson Barracks. Lucy tried to help give peace of mind to as many dying soldiers as she could by taking down their names and addresses so family members could be notified of their death. During the war, Lucy met a soldier who was also from St. Charles, Fred Kaiser. After the war and after he recovered from his wounds, they returned to St. Charles and were married. 
Lucy never attended any of the Civil War reunions or Decoration Day services because she felt they were too painful. Both General Farnsworth and Lucy Kaiser are buried at the North Cemetery in St. Charles. St. Charles and the Spanish-American War Not much is included in the St. Charles Heritage Center archives about the Spanish-American War, but one resident who was a veteran of that war stands out in St. Charles history. Carl Asplund first arrived in St. Charles in 1896, but left a short time later to fight in the Spanish-American War. Upon returning to St. Charles, he took a job as a carpenter at the Moline Valuable Iron Works Foundry. Asplund was involved in the community and especially interested in the youth of St. Charles. In 1912, he formed Boy Scout Troop No. 1. The troop would eventually be sponsored by the American Legion, post-342. The troop is still active today and still sponsored by the American Legion. Asplund served as Scoutmaster for Troop No. 1 for 14 years and as Scout Counselor and Commissioner for another 23 until his death in 1949. At the time of his death, at age 87, Asplund was known throughout the scouting community as the world's oldest scout. St. Charles and World War I When the United States entered World War I in 1917, the residents of St. Charles answered Uncle Sam's call in a variety of ways. Hundreds of boys and men left to fight with the Army or the Navy. Many women from the area volunteered as nurses in the Red Cross. The local papers were full of stories and advertisements encouraging folks to buy Liberty Loan Bonds. And any number of patriotic-themed floats could be seen participating in parades up and down Main Street. It seemed only logical then when on September 8, 1919, 29 St. Charles residents formed a local post of the American Legion. Post number 342 was formed almost six months to the day after a group of American soldiers held a meeting in France and decided to create an organization to offer assistance in gaining benefits for veterans who had fought in a war. In the beginning, Post 342 did not have a permanent location for their meetings. So for the first few years, they held their meetings in various rooms around town. Then, in 1925, Edward Baker and his wife, Harriet Rockwell Baker, presented the city with the Baker Community Center, a living memorial to their son, Henry, who died at the age of 23 in 1914, and to all of the men from St. Charles who served in World War I. American Legion Post 342 was given a designated meeting room in the new building as their permanent home. Over 300 men from St. Charles served in what was then called the War to End All Wars. Their names are on a plaque outside the front door of the Baker Community Center. Lewis Rockwell is just one of the many names inscribed on that plaque. Rockwell was the grandson of early St. Charles Mayor H.T. Rockwell and nephew to Mrs. Harriet Rockwell Baker. He was also a cousin to Thomas Farnsworth, the grandson of Civil War General John Farnsworth. Farnsworth and Rockwell both served in France during World War I, and their chance encounter was recalled in an article which appeared in the St. Charles Chronicle on October 17, 1918. A letter written by Rockwell to Farnsworth's parents was quoted in the article. In the letter, Rockwell explained that on Friday, September 13, 1918, he was stationed with a platoon of reserves in the French countryside. They heard the buzz of airplanes overhead and looked up to see an American plane being chased by three German planes. Rockwell and his comrades saw the planes engage in a firefight. One of the German planes crashed and it became clear that the American plane was in distress. The American plane was able to make an emergency landing in the woods not too far from where Rockwell was. He broke from his platoon to go in search of the pilot, fearing that other help would not reach him in time. Upon arriving at the plane and finding the pilot, Rockwell was surprised to discover the man was his cousin Thomas. Farnsworth was badly wounded. His only words to his cousin were, they haven't got me yet. Unfortunately, his wounds were too severe and he died a few hours later in a hospital. This chilling story is just one of many involving the soldiers from St. Charles. Included in the Heritage Center's archive is a document entitled, Roll of Honor, Our Dead. 21 men from St. Charles are listed in this document, along with the date, 
cause and location of their death. Included in this list is Wilford Oakes, who was a corporal in the 129th Infantry at the time of his death in 1918. Oakes was the first St. Charles boy to be killed in action in the war. Word of his death first reached his family on the morning of November 7, 1918, in a letter sent by one of Oakes' comrades. Two official letters from the government arrived three days later on November 10th, the first stating that Oakes had been wounded, and the second informing the family of his death. The timing of the arrival of these letters was especially difficult for the family due to the general atmosphere of merriment in downtown St. Charles on both November 7th and the 11th. Impromptu celebrations and parades broke out on both days in 1918. On November 7th, the first announcements were made that the war was over and that Germany had surrendered. Men, women, and children began pouring out of businesses, homes, and schools and took to the streets to celebrate. According to a newspaper article from the time, every whistle in town broke loose. Factory employees did not ask for time, but took it. Grabbing hat and coat, they bolted down to Main Street and got into line. Some had flags, but most did not. The group marched from 5th Street up to 5th Avenue, circled the block up to the high school, and continued back across the river. They repeated this loop over and over, only ending when an evening rain forced them inside. Amongst the throngs of people were Civil War veterans who could best understand what the end to the conflict meant. While many could not march in the parade, they came out to take part in the celebration. Four days later, on Monday, November 11th, word arrived that the official armistice was reached. Celebration once again broke out. More parading started, and Mayor Edwin Hunt proclaimed the day to be a holiday. All stores and offices were closed. Reports from the afternoon described two instances of mock funeral processions going down the street, with a likeness of the Kaiser being dragged behind a hearse. City officials took part in one of the processions, as did the Boy Scouts. Later, Lillian Oakes, the younger sister of Wilfred Oakes, wrote a poem about her memories of that first Armistice Day. Her poem continued to run on Armistice Day in the St. Charles Chronicle as a tribute to her brother. In the days of 18, our boys sailed away, far across the sea, to fight and make America safe for you and me. He took sick on the way across, too ill to fight for a time. Then came a letter, somewhere in France. He was in the firing line. One day, two letters were delivered to us. Your boy has been wounded, we read. With shaking hands, we opened the other. Your boy has died, it said. He gave his life for his country, this lad of 22 years. Why did it have to be our boy? We argued through our tears. Next day, bells rang and whistles blew. The armistice had been signed. We could not join the merry crowd. We had lost our boy in that line. A few years later, his body came home in a flag-draped coffin at rest to stay in this land of America, the place he loved the best. I can still hear taps and the gun salute the song of the vacant chair. Yes, those are my memories of that Armistice Day and our boys who fought over there. The heroic men who served during World War I were not the only St. Charles residents to do so. Women once again answered the call and served as nurses in the Red Cross. Emma Lake was born in St. Charles in the 1870s and attended the East Side School in town. Sometime after graduation, Emma moved to New York and worked as the secretary to the president of the College of Political Science at Columbia University. Emma felt a sense of duty calling her when the United States entered the war and she left Columbia to join the Red Cross. She served in France and saw duty in both civilian and military relief efforts in Paris and Dijon. After the war, Emma lived in Greensburg, Pennsylvania, where she was involved in health and public welfare work. She died on July 4, 1932, at her home in Greensburg. She was buried in the St. Charles North Cemetery. In 1961, at the bequest of her sister Bertha, Emma's Red Cross nurses' uniforms were donated to the St. Charles Historical Society. Also donated at that time was a portrait of Emma painted by her brother-in-law, Robert Whitson.